Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Applying a Single Cell GPS to Discover Novel Spatial Biomarkers in FFPE Tissues. I'm Susie Valdez of Labrits and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Akoya Biosciences, the spatial biology company. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at akoyabio.com. So let's get started. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click that send button. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, simply click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Koda Mayaki, physician scientist at Kyushu University, Dr. Aaron Mayer, co-founder and chief scientific officer at Enable Medicine, and Dr. Oliver Robach, senior manager at the applications at Akoya Biosciences. For a compute biography of our presenters, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Brabach, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction, and thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. My name is Oliver, and I'll give you the intro to the following two speakers, Kota Miyawaki from Kyushu University and Aaron Mayer at Enable Medicine, who produced the study that we will be talking about today. It's titled, Applying a Single Cell GPS to Discover Novel Spatial Biomarkers in FFBE Tissues. So I would like to lead off this webinar by talking about high-dimensional biology with the codex technology. High-dimensional biology, or in-situ phenotyping, will, in our opinion, fuel decades of new discoveries. And what you can see here is biological tissue, actually a piece of breast cancer. It's about two millimeters from bottom to top and three and a half millimeters from left to right. This tissue is stained with seven different biomarkers. You can see them here. In different colors. Now, if I toggle through this slide, you can see another four different biomarkers plus that piece. Here are another five biomarkers. Each one of these images shows you a different biology about this tissue. This type of experiment, this type of high dimensional biomarker labeling, gives you a sense of phenotyping. Every cell is registered and every cell is marked with a combination of many different biomarkers. In the case of this experiment, I have just gone through 32 different biomarkers. Here are four more. But all taken, taken together, there are 36 biomarkers on this tissue. This is a highly multiplex analysis of a breast cancer tissue. With Codex, you can resolve up to 40 different biomarkers or protein targets in an intact tissue. Thus, you can conduct your phenotyping in situ. Once again, this is extremely high dimensional, very, very informative about what is happening in your tissue. Now, one of the things that is absolutely crucial to spatial biology is that every cell is accounted for. And you can see this in this slide. This is a Voronoi plot, which is essentially a spatial map of phenotyped cells represented against its true background. So every cell here is registered as either, as either a green or a yellow or a blue item in the position in which the cell is found. You have red basal cells, for example. You have green, other types of epithelial cells. And you have a stroma in blue. Every cell is accounted for in a, in a codex experiment because you have true single cell resolution. You can also see a Tisney plot here on the bottom left. This is another representation of these cells. Each dot is one cell. Each color is one phenotype. This result is akin to this result. It is the same thing, but two representations are side by side. Now, in a codex experiment, as I said before, you have high biomarker flexing ability. You can look at many different biomarkers, and every cell is accounted for because this technology relies on optical microscopy, which gives you single cell access. So how does the codex system work, and what is the codex system? Codex is essentially a microfluidic device that you can see here. This is white and blue box. 
approximately the size of a benchtop printer, and it has a series of valves and pumps that um, handle fluids that are required to run this experiment. This system is based on epifluorescence microscopy and connects seamlessly with imaging systems like the Kian's BZX unit. You can see that right here. So side by side, these two units do not take up very much space in your laboratory. They fit on any bench top, and it's readily compatible with epifluorescence imaging systems. So this is a system that you can easily import into your lab, and it shall not have a very big footprint. How does the Codex experiment work? In its essence, Codex is ultra-high-flex immunohistochemistry. So what do we mean by that? What you can do in a Codex experiment is you can design an antibody panel of 40 or more antibodies. Each antibody is conjugated to an oligo. You can see that little red line here. There's your antibody in black, the little red line is your oligo. Once all of your antibodies have been conjugated with the oligos, you can stain your tissue. All of the antibodies go onto your tissue at once. This is the only manual handling step that you need to do. Incubation time is the only time it takes that you have to wait. Once the antibodies are on there, the tissue is labeled, you can walk away from it and the machine takes over. It's important to note here that this one-step staining procedure is done with reagents that we provide to you. All of the oligos are provided, all of the reagents, um, permeabilization solutions, fixation solutions, and so on and so forth are provided to you. But one question that is also important to address right up front is about the antibodies. So some antibodies, for example, an antibody against CD4 or CD8, are inventoried by us. That means you can buy them off the shelf. However, there are many others that people are interested in. These are not readily available in our inventory. In that case, you just take whatever antibody you're interested in, conjugate it with our oligo, and thereby make it compatible for the codex experiment. So it is very flexible and adaptable for your type of research if you like. Now, once your tissue is labeled, it goes into the codex system and goes into the imager. And what happens is all of your antibodies that are now on the tissue labeled with your oligos will be um, revealed with oligo sequences that have fluorophores on them. So what happens is the machine dispense, dispense three different types of fluorophores. Each one has an oligo that is complementary to three antibodies. Microscope then takes a picture. You can see that here. This is what we call cycle one. After cycle one is completed, the reporters are removed. Cycle goes back. Tissue is now unlabeled with fluorophores, but still has the primary antibodies on it. The machine then proceeds to add three more reporters on it. These are three reporters that have different oligo sequences in the first round. Thus, the microscope can take a different picture. That's what you would see in cycle two. This repeats itself until all of the antibodies, up to 40 or more, that you want to look at have been imaged. And you can see that here. This is a sequence of 16 cycles. Each image is completely different than the other one, but every time we're looking at the same tissue. This is spatial biology. This is how it works, and this is a very um, robust experiment. One of the things that's very good about this experiment also is there's no stripping involved, so it's rather gentle. Um, we don't, um, there's no heat treatments involved, it's just isothermal reactions. And finally, there are no host-to-host -host cross reactivities. So this is unlike 1-2 immunohistochemistry, our detection is oligo-based, so you do not need to worry about host-to-host -host cross reactivities, background, and other types of messy interactions that we observe with conventional immunohistochemistry. That's what makes this system possible, and that's what gives you a very clean result from cycle to cycle. Now, lastly, I would like to say that Codex is widely deployable. Again, this is based on conventional epifluorescence microscopy, so it allows you to access and image tissues that you would expect from any other type of um, um, fluorescence imaging experiment. So here you can see melanoma, brain, lung, skin, kidney, spleen, even blood cells. All of these are codex data. Each one of this is a codex experiment that was done on different type of tissue, different preparation, FFPE, fresh frozen, human or mouse. It's extremely widely deployable and compatible with many different preparations. And I'm very excited today to introduce an experiment that was done on human gut tissue by CODA and Enable Medicine as a collaboration. And what they did is they studied graft-versus-host disease, which is a 
uh, an immune reaction that occurs sometimes when people obtain bone marrow transplants where the donated cells wrongly attack the gut or the epithelial layer of the gut. Um, and it's um, not very well known, but the experiment for us was very interesting because it shows once again that this type of biology is highly relevant in making new discoveries and problems that we face today in healthcare. So with that, I'm really excited to move on over and pass it towards Coda, who will introduce the GVHD and will introduce the experiment, and hopefully you will enjoy the next part of this webinar as well. Thank you for your kind introduction, Oliver. Hello, everyone. My name is Kota Miyagi from Kyushu University, and I'm broadcasting this webinar from Japan. I am researching hematological malignancies such as leukemia and lymphoma as a hematologist. In the next 30 minutes, I and Aaron will show you our study titled High Dimension Mucosal Immune Profile Predict Prognosis of GAT GBGD. I'm really excited to share our experience of analysis using CODEX for GAT mucosal sample. And I'm hoping this will provide you with some information which helps you out to apply the CODEX analysis into your research and expand it. I think many of the audience are not familiar with GVHD. So let me start with the quick intro of this disease. And also I will explain why we are doing this research. GVHD, which is the abbreviation of graft versus host disease is the major complication during hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, also known as bone marrow transplant. As you might know, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has been a curing option for patients with blood cancers. Sometimes it could be the only option for cure. In this process, patients' blood cells, including immune cells, are wiped out and replaced by a donor-derived blood cells. Sometimes donor-derived immune cells attack the patient's healthy tissues, such as gut, liver, or skin, because they originate from patients, I mean host, which result in severe inflammation and tissue damage. This immune attack from donated cells against host tissue is called GVHD. When GVHD occurs in the gut, severe inflammation is observed in the gut mucosa as shown in this endoscopic image. GAT GBGD is a common and significant complication and can be lethal. When patients experience severe GAT GBGD, like grade 3 or grade 4 disease, their overall survival would be only 25%. So the successful control of GAT GBGD is a critical factor of prognosis for patients after transplantation. Current standard of care therapy for GAT GBHD is the systemic administration of steroids. But a substantial number of patients eventually relapsed, and their prognosis is inferior, as you can see in the survival curve. Therefore, we would like to know the prognostic factor, like who will respond well to initial steroid therapy, uh, which can help us to design the optimal treatment strategy. And also, we would like to know why some patients are refractory to steroid therapy. This situation led us to launch this GBHD study. In recent years, thanks to many scientists' efforts, we have started to understand what kind of immune reaction takes place in the gut. I cited this figure from Nature Review paper uh, you can see that various immune cells, such as mast cells or granulocytes or innate lymphoid cells, uh, which are the essential players in innate immunity, and many T cells. And these immune cells interact with each other in response to gut microbiota, uh, playing a critical role in gut health. However, as of now, which immune reaction affects the clinical cause of gut GBGD is still unknown. So we set the aim of this study to understand the underlying mechanism of gut GBGD, primarily focusing on their clinical costs. 
For this purpose, we first try to understand who is the prognostic determinant among various immune cells. In other words, we attempted to identify cell populations associated with the prognosis of gut GVGD. Also, we try to unveil how they interact with each other, the mechanism associated with clinical behavior of gut GVGD, such as steroid responsiveness. Before diving into the results part, I should tell you about the methodological challenges in this research. The biggest research barrier was the sample limitation. Because the samples of gut GBT tissues are obtained by endoscopic biopsy from severely ill patients who are suffering from severe diarrhea, uh, the sample size and the number of tissues are small and limited in general. In addition to that, biopsy samples are usually archived as formally fixed tissues called FFP tissues. So most of accessible samples for gut GBT research is limited to FFP samples. Generally speaking, RNA or DNA extracted from FFP tissues is severely degraded um, and is not suitable for whole transcriptional analysis such as iron and stick. Because they are already fixed, we cannot dissociate tissues and generate a single cell suspension, which means that it's hard to perform single cell analysis, such as single cell iron and stick or site off for sedimentary analysis, all of which are common procedure for the global immune profiling. To overcome these limitations, we utilize two novel technologies and a kind of system from Nanostring and the codex system from Acoya. Here is the overall methodological design for our study. First, we performed global gene expression profiling using the Anaconda system. Anaconda is probe-based RNA profiling technology and enables accurate gene expression profiling even in RNA from FFP tissues. In this plot, we compared gene expression data from two replicated experiments using the Anaconda system and try to see the data's reproducibility. You can see how the data are accurate and reliable. This means that this system can accurately detect gene expression even from minor immune cells in the tissues. Using this system, we evaluated 800 of immune-related genes, including cell surface markers or functional molecules, uh, which define immune cell populations. And we combined a gene expression result with clinical parameters and tried to extract gen genes linked to clinical outcomes of gut GVGD. In the next step, we performed multiplex imaging analysis by codex with the help of Aaron from Enable Medicine. We stained the gut GBT tissues with 38 antibodies and performed a high plex spatial analysis to validate and expand the end kind of analysis results. And again, uh, we evaluated the, these results in combination with clinical parameters. We first expanded our analysis by combining the spatial analysis result and gene expression results. Aaron will talk about codex analysis in detail in the latter part. Before that, I'll tell you a little bit about what we get from encode analysis. Here is the volcano plot, a simple and a common solution to compare gene expression levels between two groups and find out genes that are specifically affiliated in either group. This volcano plot tells us which genes are affiliated in steroid responders or non-responders. Each dot represents each gene analyzed by encounter. So this should be 800 dots here. The x-axis represents the differences in expression levels between two groups, and the y-axis represents statistical significance. Genes located upper right should be favorable prognostic genes, and the upper left guys should be non-responder specific genes. And we categorize these genes depending on cell types by color, as shown here, including T cells or macrophage subtypes. 
and try to discover cell populations that are specifically associated with the patient's clinical outcomes. In contrast, uh, most of the macrophage-specific genes shown in red were populated in non-responders. These results motivated us to see whether we can stratify patients by mast cell or macrophage signature and are associated with prognosis. This heatmap figure shows the results of the hierarchical clustering analysis. Mast cells and macrophage signature genes were represented as green and red, respectively. GAT DBG patients could be categorized into three groups. The mast cell group upregulated only mast cell genes. Macrophage group specifically upregulated the macrophage genes. And the intermediate group includes samples that express both mast cells and mass macrophage genes, and samples which express neither. As you can see, in this couple of Mayo curve, the overall survival of the mast cell signature group is much better than those of macrophage signature. Thus, we demonstrate that the immune related gene signature clearly reflects the prognosis of GAP GBG patients. Now, uh, these results raise the following question Do they really exist in the tissues? How do they interact with each other? To uncover the background mechanism, we proceeded to the next step, codex analysis. Here, I'd love to pass over the mic to my collaborator, Aaron, uh, who made an outstanding contribution to this study. He will explain how we performed codex analysis and how we interpreted the data. Thanks, Koda. At Enable Medicine, we were very excited to team up with Coda on this particular project to employ the Codex platform to study GVHD. We thought that Codex would be particularly well suited for providing insights into Coda's questions due to its ability to simultaneously look at a variety of cell types, their functional states, and interactions. In general, at Enable Medicine, we specialize in the generation and analysis of hyplex imaging data. This includes all the way from six to seven color immunofluorescent images, such as those acquired with the Phenoptics workflow, up to 40 plus biomarker images acquired with Codex. We're working on the development of novel machine learning and computer vision algorithms to provide new insights into spatially multiplex data. For this particular project, we worked with Coda and his team to develop a custom 30 plus biomarker panel. Here are some examples of the various biomarkers included in this high-plex GVHD codex panel. You can see that these markers range from identifiers of cell type, such as CD3, CD4, and CD8 T cells, CD68 macrophage, and mast cell tryptases, to tissue markers including CD31 vessels and podoplanin positive lymphatics. And furthermore, markers of cellular functional state, such as KI67, a common marker of cell proliferation. This slide highlights the results of this 30 plus plex codex panel applied to a gut biopsy taken from one of CODA's patients with GVHD. The first thing you can appreciate is the beauty of this multiplex tissue data. As the image flashes, you are visualizing various combinations of biomarkers from the codex panel on the same tissue section. Now, if we slow that down and look at just seven markers from the panel, you can appreciate right away the tissue structure and cellular organization of the gut that Codex allows you to visualize. Here you can see a zoom in of region one depicting gut epithelium highlighted by cytokeratin in the cyan color. You can see CD8 T cells infiltrating this tissue in blue. Some of these cells are proliferative as observed by co-staining with KI67 in yellow. You can see mast cells in the tissue highlighted by mast cell tryptase and magenta and a lone regulatory T cell in this zone indicated by FOXP3 in green. In region two, we're highlighting lymphatic vessels outlined by protoplanin staining in red. Now this is just one set of seven markers taken from this codex panel, and you can already appreciate spatial organization and complexity at the cellular level. We acquired these codex images on all, pa on all patients from CODA's GVHD cohort and that allowed us to qualitatively observe how the expression of these different markers varied as a function of disease state. Here we are highlighting increased GVHD score in the gut as you look at these patient biopsies from left to right. And you may be able to observe increased inflammation, 
breakdown of tissue architecture, and changes in the various expression levels of these biomarkers if you look closely. But what we want to do more than this would to be able to quantify the data and discover features that statistically affect prognosis, patient outcomes, and disease progression. Well, we can do just that. Utilizing a cell segmentation algorithm, we are able to segment out all the single cells from CODA's GVHD gut biopsies and essentially create a high-dimensional single-cell data set without ever needing to grind up the tissue. In this way, each cell can be represented mathematically by its expression of various biomarkers and its spatial coordinates, which are retained. In this example, we are highlighting a segmented cell that is positive for KI67, CD4, FOXP3, and CD3, while being negative for CD8. The immunologists in the room likely recognize this right away as a proliferating regulatory T cell. But how do we go about automatically and systematically identifying and enumerating cell types across the cohort? For this challenge, a variety of algorithms can be selected from depending upon your study goals. In this case, we wanted to get an unbiased look into the cell types present in the gut GVHD samples, so we ran unsupervised clustering on all of the single cells that had been segmented from CODA's images. In this 2D representation of high dimensional space, known as a force directed layout, each dot represents a cell and each color represents a cluster label. The cells cluster together in space based on their similarity to one another, as determined by their biomarker profile. We can visualize this in a heat map like format, where red is high expression and blue is low, and look at the expression of various markers in each of the clusters the algorithm has assigned. In this way, we can then go through and label the clusters with the cell types they represent. For example, this cluster here in the middle, high for protoplanin expression, we labeled as lymphatic endothelial cells. On this slide, we're showing just another representation of the clustering results that groups the cells together and allows one to more quickly evaluate the relative frequencies of each cell type. For example, many cells were classified as lamina propria and epithelium in cyan and teal respectively, as would be expected for the gut. You can then compare this with the varying population sizes for the infiltrating resident immune cells found in this cohort. With this framework, we've now shown how CODA has the ability to quantify biomarker expression and changing cell frequencies between the GBHD patients. But our analysis allows us to go a step further. Since CODEX maintains the cell spatial coordinates, we can map the cell types we've just identified through single cell analysis back to the tissue. Here I'm depicting that as we move from the multiplex image at left to the cell type map at right. In these cellular maps, which we refer to as Voronoi diagrams, each cell is represented mathematically in a graph type fashion. Each cell is depicted with a color and letter label. For example, you can see mast cells in red labeled with the letter A. The power, of these cells map, the power of these cell maps is they allow us to mathematically index each cell and compute its interactions with its neighbors. These interactions can be cell-cell contacts, or higher order neighborhoods of cells that may be present in the tissue. The graph at right shows a cell-cell contact network diagram, where the bar size represents the cell frequency and the cords represent the contacts. So for example, this green cell here, which is a CD4 T cell, is interacting highly with the lamina appropria in this particular patient's tissue, seen by the cells in blue. With these tools in hand, Koda went back and tested his hypotheses regarding gut GVHD and patient outcomes. He will now share with you the preliminary results from the study. Thank you, Aaron. In this study, we prepared 28 gut GBGD specimens, all of which were obtained from endoscopic biopsies. We need to place sliced FFP samples on the cover slips in codex analysis, as shown in this image. Among 28 samples, we could successfully obtain image data from 26 specimens, including 10 responders and 16 of non-responders, as shown in this chart. From this slide, I will show the result of codex analysis in our GVGD study. We first analyzed whether or not mast cells or macrophage actually exist in the gut GVGD tissues and evaluated their frequencies. Here shows representative two cases, CMZV16 from the responder group who survives more than five and a half years after transplantation, and CMZV31 from non-responder group who unfortunately died from severe GVHD reaction 
only four months after transplant. Macrophages are shown in purple and mast cells are shown in yellow. You can see that yellow mast cells are scattered around the tissue even in the low power image and responders and their number is much larger than non-responders. In a similar way, purple macrophages are abundant in the non-responder group. We can confirm the number and morphology of mast cells and macrophages in the high power image more clearly. We next analyze whether or not the number of muscle cells or macrophages are associated with patient's prognosis. We divided patients into two groups depending on the number of observed muscle cells or macrophages in codex analysis. In the left Caprimonio survival curve, the blue line represents the muscle cell rich group and the orange represents the muscle cell poor group. As you can see, the muscle cell rich patients showed better survival compared with the muscle cell poor group. In contrast, in the right survival curve, macrophage rich patients showed poor prognosis. Now we can confirm the existence and the number of muscle cells and macrophages in the gut GBT tissues tightly associated with patients' prognosis. In the second part, we focus on the cell to cell interaction and understand uh, underlying mechanism of how muscle cells or macrophages are associated with GBHD prognosis. Through these analysis, oh, we found mast cells might directly suppress immune cell activation. As Aaron explained in his part, we analyze cell to cell interaction based on their proximity and try to understand which cell interaction is most associated with prognosis. Again, here shows the Volcano plot, but this time each dot represents cell to cell interaction, not gene expression. From this Volcano plot, cell to cell interaction between mast cells and the lamina propria macrophage or CD11CDC genetic cells or CDAT cells is most associated with favorable prognosis. And macrophage interaction such as lamina propria macrophage with CDAT cells or CD11B macrophage with CDAT cells are most associated with poor prognosis. We can confirm these results in the tissue image obtained by Codex. Uh, for example, in the responder group, muscle cells and CDAT cells frequently exist adjacent to each other, shown in the upper fluorescent image and showing the lower image from Bronor analysis. In the non-responder group, uh, macrophages tend to reside next to CDAT cells in these images. We can also quantify these cell-to-cell -cell interactions on a tissue-by-tissue -tissue basis uh, and compare them between the responder and non-responder groups. Uh, we can observe marked difference in specific cell-to-cell -cell interactions with statistical significance and validate the volcano plot results. Among many prognostic cell to cell interactions, we are focusing on the interaction between mast cells and CD11C DCs, dendritic cells. As shown in the ROC curve, the inter interaction between mast cells and CD11C DCs seem to have strong predictive power. In the codex image, CD11C DC yellow cells line up along the intestinal epithelium shown in blue in the basal layer. You can see the interesting morphological observation of CD11CDC with balloon body morphology extending dendrites into epithelium junction. And the muscles shown in red often exist adjacent to CD11CDCs. As shown in the dot plot, the cell to cell interaction between mast cells and CD11CDC is much more abundant in the responder group. And survival analysis clearly shows the prognostic impact of this cell to cell interaction as a favorable prognostic signature. Next, we focus on another favorable prognostic interaction between mast cells and CDA cytotoxic T cells. And this time, we added another parameter 
functional parameters, KI67, into the analysis. As you might know, KI67 is a well-known proliferation marker stand for in the nucleus. Please look at this image and please focus on the CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells stained by magenta. The cells stained both in magenta and yellow represent proliferating cytotoxic T cells. They are cycling. And cells express the only magenta uh, represent resting cytotoxic T cells. And we notice that cytotoxic T cells adjacent to mast cells tend to be K67 negative. Then we quantify the expression level of K67 in CD8 cytotoxic T cells and the distance from muscle cells. As shown in this figure, most of the cytotoxic T cells located near muscle cells are resting. Now, these results suggest that muscle cells might directly suppress cytotoxic T cells and contribute to the inflammation suppression. Finally, we combine the cell to cell interaction data from CADEX with gene expression data from end count analysis. Through this approach, we found that macrophage interactions are associated with inflammatory gene expression. As shown in previous slides, macrophages are associated with unfavorable clinical outcomes. And here, we evaluated the correlation between specific cell to cell interaction and gene expression and try to explore the novel link between them. As a result, we found that cell to cell interaction between macrophages and lymphatic endothelial cells is tightly linked to ATG7 expression as the top ranked correlation among all combinations. We observed a marked expression of ATG7 in the non responder group, and in these cases, Macrophages and the lymphatic endothelial cells are spatially associated with each other. ADG7 is an autophagy protein, and according to the paper published in this year, ADG7 is a critical regulator of inflammation and promotes endothelial cell permeability and inflammation. So these data suggest the possibility that ADG7 expression induced through interaction with macrophages uh, could be functional molecule and contribute to CB inflammation and prognosis in macrophage-rich gut GBG patients. As we wrap up the results from this study, in the gut GBG patients, mast cells may contribute to favorable clinical outcomes by directly suppressing cytotoxic T cells activation to reduce inflammation, and interacting with CD11C DCs. Also, uh, macrophages may be associated with proper prognosis by disrupting the serial cells and contributing to inflammation, presumably through the interaction with ATG7. In the future, we would like to know the underlying mechanism more precisely, which is what determines the mast cell macrophage signature. Here is today's recap. We demonstrated a proof of concept study of Acquia Codex in FFP GBGD gut specimens. Enable Medicine performed acquisition and analysis of high-flex codex data. We discussed new spatial analysis methods, including correlation of cell interaction with cell state and gene expression data. Codex analysis identified and validated a novel cell signature associated with GBHD prognosis. Codex reveals several potential biological mechanisms. Thank you for your attention and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Miyawaki and Dr. Nair and Dr. Brabach for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of the screen.
We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. It looks like we already have some great questions coming in. I'll start with you, Dr. Barbach. <clears throat> Our first question yeah, is, thank you. Do, you need, do you need to use the secondary antibody? Um, that's a good question. Um, so basically, in this system, we do not use secondary antibodies. Um, so what happens is your primary antibody is con conjugated or tagged with an oligonucleotide sequence. And then the way we visualize that primary antibody is via a fluorophore that has a complementary oligo sequence on it. So rather than using a secondary antibody to detect your primary, you now use an oligo that has a fluorescent tag on it. The advantage of doing that is that you don't have to strip the oligo and the fluorophore off of your tissue. You can um, dehybridize it or you can use a solvent to remove it, which overall is a much milder effect than what you would have if you did primary, secondary antibody detection. Then lastly, this also has the advantage that it prevents um, messy, let's say nonspecific staining of, for, for example, when you have a secondary antibody that is raised in a mouse, it oftentimes binds to nonspecific epitopes in the mouse tissue. This does not happen in the codex system because, again, it is oligo-based. So long answer here, but the short answer, short answer is no, we do not use a secondary antibody. Thanks for that one. Thank you so much. And Dr. Mayer, this question is for you. How do you conduct cell segmentation using Bolinol, and what is the merit cell segmentation using Bolinol? Thanks, that's a great question. So first, a clarification. The cell segmentation itself is actually performed using algorithms like watershed, uh, which are traditional cell segmentation algorithms to isolate uh, the cells. Uh, you could also imagine using uh, novel sort of computer vision or deep learning approaches to apply your cell segmentation. The Voronoi is just a way to visualize those results. So the Voronoi is actually a mathematical or graphical representation of the data, and it allows you to be able to compute edges between cells as well as distances. So the Voronoi is quite uh, useful for visualizing the data, whereas the cell segmentation is done earlier during the processing of the images. Thank you very much, and I want to thank our Thank I, yes, I want to thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. Our next question, and either Dr. Barbach or Dr. Mary, you can try this one. What tools can be used for the analysis of high-plex codex data, and does Acquia offer them, or does one have to use, let's say, a third-party tool? Oh, I can take this question here, Aaron. Um, so, what tools can be used for the analysis of codex data? Um, the very simple approach is to use our own built-in software, which is called the Multiplex Analysis Viewer, or MAV. This is an ImageJ-based plugin that is provided free of charge to anyone who's using codex or who's interested in codex. You can actually download this software today and request sample data sets um, to practice um, your data analysis on some imaging data that we can provide to you. Just go to our website and request it there. Um, regarding third-party tools, all of the data are structured in, as, as tab, comma-separated values. So really, the raw data look very much like, let's say, single sequencing data or something. So you can export these data readily into any third-party platform that you're um, interested in. So we see a lot of people exporting our data into um, R or Python. Um, some people use Surat plugins. So it is based on the raw data structure, very versatile and very easy to move it out and into a third-party platform if that is what you prefer. Thanks for that. Thank you so much. And Dr. Miwaki, this is a question for you. Mass cells are usually easy to see in H and E sections. Are the immunomodulatory, I'm sorry, immunology modulatory mast cells 
seen in this study evidence in the original H&E section. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question. And unfortunately, we didn't uh, check the, um, we didn't stain any uh, mother or mouth cells in the H-E, but it, we, we didn't check the muscle cells and in the HE section. Um, I don't think, I, I think we need to stain a specific muscle marker to detect it. Thank you so much. And Dr. Brabach, if you try to detect several or many CD markers that you predict to express in a cell, don't the antibodies physically interrupt each other? And this is a two-part question from our audience member. If the receptor occupancy of each marker is quite high, won't any interruption happen? That's a good question. We get that question often. Um, we do not have any empirical evidence that this happens. Um, thus far, there is no, no confirmation that this happens. I think on a nanoscale level, you will predict that it's very, very much possible indeed, but we have not been able to demonstrate that. I'd also like to note that some of the highest plex um, antibody applications of codex or, or similar systems, they go beyond 40 biomarkers, which is what we're offering commercially. For example, at Stanford, they're using 56 biomarkers. And generally, the large majority of these biomarkers are cluster differentiation marker biomarkers, so CD molecules, like the ones you're mentioning. And to my knowledge, this has not been an issue, or this has not been demonstrated. So with what we provide you, I don't think you need to worry about this. Um, there should be no interruption, and you should be able to faithfully detect the cluster differentiation antigens on the surface of your cell that you are interested in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our audience members for these great questions coming in. And if you have a specific question for one of our presenters, you are more than welcome to add their name to your question as well. Dr. Miyawaki, this question is for you. It looks like you placed multiple biopsy FSPE sections on the cover slip. Can you share any tips and tricks on how this was done? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's also a very good question. And yeah, it, it's very um, tough to um, place in multiple sections in one cover suite, but um, definitely it, it can it can save you a lot of cost. Um, so I think I, um, some uh, lab technicians uh, could not do that, but uh, one, uh, we have, fortunately, we have very good, talented um, lab technician, and he helped me out to play, uh, to make uh, this section. So I think um, we can communicate uh, with privately, so please give me the email, um, sorry, um, the email, the hyplex and enablemedicine.com, and uh, I can answer personally. Thank you. And thank you so much. And Dr. Mayor, Dr. Brabach, I'm going to ask this next question, and one of you can decide who wants to take it. I understand that Aquia has several panels of antibodies. How did you validate the antibody specificity, and how do you validate the specificity of antibodies that have highly homologous family members? That's a great question. I'll chime in here first, and then Oliver can follow up. Um, so in general, one can make custom panels, and uh, there's several ways that you can go about validating the panel. First off, I'll say the antibodies that are known to work well in your uh, tissue of interest, whether that's FFPE or fresh frozen, um, are a good place to start. Then those would be conjugated uh, with the barcodes that Oliver was mentioning earlier to prepare them for the codex workflow. And then you would stain your tissue, first potentially in experiments where you just use that antibody alone, as well as in combination experiments where you apply co and counter stains. This allows you to detect if the pattern um, follows the standard morphology that you would expect for the stain, as well as to compare it amongst things that you would expect it, that it should stain with and um, things that you expect that it would not stain with. 
Uh, there's a number of steps that can go into validating this, such as also including positive and negative control tissues. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss offline uh, the full process of how we validate antibody panels for different settings. Oliver, do you want to take it from there? Oh, uh, yeah. So I think Aaron captured the gist of this here. Um, essentially, what we do in-house is every time we we test a new antibody or we, um, we um, produce a new antibody, for that matter, we do a side-by-side -side comparison of a uh, codex antibody, that is an antibody conjugated to an oligo and detected to be an oligofluorophore, versus a conventional primary secondary antibody detection method. This is done on um, adjacent sections of the same tissue and side-by-side -side analysis is performed. Um, then we do antibody titrations to see whether or not the antibodies behave as um, expected. So they should give you lower signal with higher um, dilutions and vice versa. And then we um, address the antibody specificity by a rigorous regime of taking the antibody in question and counterstaining it with multiple positive and negative controls. This is in a regional and in a cell-specific environment. So overall, that gives us a very good idea of um, if, you're an if the antibody is specific and only antibodies that pass that um, qualification will be um, deemed validated. Lastly, I would like to mention that we work in close collaboration, of course, with the antibody suppliers. We don't make the antibodies. We work with antibody companies, and they, of course, will reconfirm whether or not our antibodies are doing what they're supposed to do. So rest assured, when we say it's validated, you can be pretty sure that it's labeling what it's supposed to. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Our next question, Dr. Brabach, is for you. Are there any tissues which is hard to analyze utilizing that codex system? And how about bone marrow sample? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Of course, there are tissues that are hard to analyze using a codex system. There are tissues that are hard to analyze with any system for that matter. So bone marrow is, is Tricky. Um, I think that's tricky for codex and, and any other any other technology that's imaging based. The problem with bone marrow is, to this date, there's still no consistent decalcification method that everybody agrees on works. So the problematic of doing bone marrow imaging already starts when you're at the cryostat or when you're sectioning FFPE. Getting good decalcification is very hard, and that translates all the way back into your codex experiment. I've used to work on bone marrow, and what I notice is that the cells in the bone marrow are very small, and they're extremely densely packed. So when you're looking at um, cluster differentiation markers in bone marrow, it's very, very difficult from an analytical point of view to really confirm, to really get unambiguous labeling of cell membranes, to segment them, and then to do analysis. So yeah, there are some difficult tissues, but um, I hope that in the introduction of this talk, we have demonstrated that you can use codex in a wide variety of tissues, some difficult ones included. And we believe that there will be more and more tissues added in the future. And I can tell you that there are several people working on bone marrow, um, but the, out the outcome of those studies is still to be seen. So thanks for that. And thank you, sir. And Dr. Mayer, this next question is for you. How can we get the cellular interaction in Information after we decide each cell type and by the distance between each type of cells or maybe by other information? Thanks for this great question. So uh, the, the question is right on here. Because we have the spatial coordinates of all of the cells in a codex experiment, we're able to look at its nearest neighbors. And so you could imagine that simply as the distance from the cell of interest. Um, so that's how you could compute these sort of cell-cell contacts or nearest neighbors. You could also imagine uh, defining a larger area. You could call this a neighborhood. And you could ask for a particular cell, um, you know, what are all of the cells that are around it in, uh, in a, you know, 10-cell radius or, you know, it's 100 nearest cells. What are those all like? And you can actually use these types of approaches to define neighborhoods that exist within the tissues as well as compute the cell-cell um, contacts. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Dr. Miyawaki, this is your question coming up. And again, I just want to thank our audience for these fabulous questions coming in. What a great Q&A we are having today. QVHD often affects 
mucosal stem cells by causing apoptosis. I, I apologize if I didn't pronounce that right. Okay, what about yeah, the it's, pop- <laughs> it's a handful. What about <laughs> the proximity of the mast cells and other immune cells no. to the mucus cell stem cells? Are they good responders compared to the proximity of the macrophage to the mucus cell stem cells? And for or are they poor responders? Can you elaborate a little bit more for us? Yeah, um, yeah. This is um, another great question. Uh, you're right. Um, many of the previous research um, shows the tight clinical relation between the uh, mucosal stem, mucosal stem cells and the GVHD. But um, unfortunately, we in this analysis we focus on more on the immune cells and not to um, uh, mucosal cells such as uh, mucosal stem cells or secretory cells. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting, and I will look into it in the next step. I will look into the relationship, spatial relationship between stem cells and mast cells or macrophages. So thank you for your suggestion. And thank you. And all three of you, thank you so much for your presentation today and for your important research. We want to thank you for your time today and we also want to thank Akoya Biosciences for their sponsoring this event today and for being a part of this event. I also want to thank our audience members for their interesting questions and for joining us today. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. You can view this webinar on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. Thank you again, Dr. Miyawaki, Dr. Nair, Dr. Brabach, and thank you again, Akoya Biosciences. Until next time, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and bye-bye.